For those in the know, Citroen will always be considered one of the automotive greats. For most of the 20th century, they were a real forward-thinking and highly innovative company with a back catalogue of incredibly cool, unusual and very successful cars. In fact, things like the DS brought features that have only become commonplace with other manufacturers some half a century later. But, thanks to a series of unfortunate events, as the millennium came and went, they have become increasingly simply a badge engineering exercise for Peugeot, and that really is a tragic fate for a once brilliant firm. However, if you look closely, you will still find in the modern era a few examples of Citroen being Citroen and doing what only they could. One such example of that is the C6. Originally intended to be launched in 2000 as a replacement for the aging XM, it actually only made its way into showrooms about five years later. Now, because this was supposed to be a rival for upmarket German cars like the BMW 5 Series, the range of engines on offer was actually pretty hefty by French car standards. You had only one four-cylinder to choose from, a 2.2-litre diesel. Then there were three V6s. A 2.7-litre diesel, as you have here, mated to a six-speed automatic gearbox, a three-litre diesel, and a three-litre V6 petrol, which is reasonably rare, but also one of the most desirable of the C6 range. In spite of this, the car was never really designed to be that much of a performer. Instead, it was meant to offer comfortable transport for those who wanted something a little bit different. The styling certainly would say that too. I've never been sure this is really much of a looker. The lights at the front seem a little bit weird, as do those at the back. And this rear sort of sloping fastback thing just doesn't quite work for me. Uh, apparently, the rear window is sort of self-cleaning somehow, but the major feature, as with Citroens of old, is the suspension. It has what they called Hydractive 3 Plus. You also have double wishbones, front and rear, which is actually pretty rare to see in this sort of market segment. Now, I have been forewarned, this car has recently been on a trip to Scotland, where it attempted to keep up with George in his Nissan Skyline R34, and it has suffered a little bit because of that. That being said, though, I am still expecting a very plush ride out of the oddball Citroen. Inside, the Citroen certainly does feel plush, at least by the standard of early naughty Citroens. This weird material here will be familiar to anyone that's driven a C4 of the same time, but there is plenty of real leather. You also get a pair of screens which form your dash and infotainment system, which was never a given for a car from this time. Everything does look actually reasonably decent, and it's also worn the ears pretty well. There's a few really cool, very classically French features, my favourite being the door bins. I love that. Technology on offer was also pretty high too. It was the first car ever to get four stars for pedestrian safety in the Euro NCAP test because it has airbags in the bonnet to raise it in the event of an accident. This particular car also has heads up display, which was standard, a sat nav, which was not. You've got an adaptive rear spoiler at the back. Later, high spec cars could even have things like lane departure warning. You could have reclining rear seats and even Wi Fi on board. This would all be pretty impressive stuff now, let alone. 10 years ago. None of that, however, helped it to sell, with fewer than 24,000 of these rolling off the production line during its seven-year run. I would hazard a guess that the majority of those stayed in its home market. It was apparently a very popular car for French government and ministers. Beyond that, though, I don't think many people actually were convinced. And that's a real shame, because it's a car that should have a lot of promise. The good news, though, is that as a second-hand buy, this is not only very affordable, the most expensive currently for sale that I could find being less than five grand, it's also exceedingly rare. On Auto Trader today, there are only six of these up for sale. To give you some context, that's the same number as you'll find LaFerrari on Auto Trader. This is a very rare car. But is it actually that good? Let's find out. It is very weird lifting the bonnet on a car as modern as this and seeing the little suspension fluid baubles that are a very obvious evolution of those you'd find in the old DS or the SM or all that sort of stuff. 
Now, I've started this review today at a car park with, as you can probably tell, the worst paved entrance you can imagine. In fact, it's not paved at all. It's, it's a dirt track with some massive dinosaur footprints on it. And actually, it's a pretty good test of this car. Now, I've perhaps been even a little harsh on it, or you could say extremely fair, because I've come down here today in a brand new Audi S8. And that is a very comfortable car too. That uses all sorts of modern, clever road scanning technology to achieve its levels of comfort. This is actually a relatively mechanical solution by comparison, but is it an inferior one? Let's see, shall we? The engine pulls actually reasonably well from low down. Gearbox is very smooth too, actually. Oh, this is wafterific, I can tell you already. The heads-up display is, well, comically retro. It's like an old calculator or a microwave oven. It's sort of typical green digits. And this evidently isn't a car which is meant to be thrown down these kind of roads. No siree. But you know what? Driving position is actually pretty good. You still feel fairly elevated even with the car in its lowest setting or its lowest permissible at this speed setting. The engine is a, a touch on the gruff side. I can't remember how much power it's supposed to make, but this one has allegedly had a remap anyway, so that's not really very relevant, let's be honest. It tells you just how obsessed Europeans were at the time with diesel because three out of the four engine options for this did use the black fuel. But you know what, actually, this engine really does suit the character of this car. It pulls nicely from low down. Now, it's over these real imperfections, manhole covers and so on and so forth. This is actually, it's actually a little, there's a little edge of harshness there. There's a little bit of crashiness. But I, I am told it was Dave, and Dave specifically, who maybe knackered this car a little bit trying to chase the GTR through Scotland, that quite obviously this thing was never able to do. Oh, it does feel so floaty and flighty. <laughs> oh, I love it. There's even little bits I didn't notice in the walk around, like the fact that you can angle the centre screen here. That's really quite cool. The controls do feel a little bit cheap and nasty French noughties, but they're not that bad, if I'm being perfectly honest. Now, I am, for once, going to press the sport suspension button. There's also a sporty button for the gearbox as well, and a winter mode too. Uh, yeah, let's, let's have the full suite, shall we? Let's go sport mode gearbox, sport mode suspension, see what a difference it makes. Power! Mm, still very floaty still very flighty, still feel like every time I go over a crest that it's just going to keep going like a golf ball on the moon smacked by Tiger Woods. The car is claiming an average over the last two and a bit thousand miles of 36.7 mpg. That's not brilliant, but it's not terrible either. And sport mode has, yeah, the steering is very light at all times. Sport mode hasn't really given it much in the way of extra weighting, but come on, you were never ever going to buy a car like this for its sporting credentials. You were going to buy it for its quirks. You were going to buy it for its comfort. This really is a car best suited to motorway cruising. There, I think it would probably be excellent. It is going to be given a refresh and overhaul of the suspension over the next few months. All the little pieces which will perish and fail over time are, are going to be replaced or upgraded as need be. And I'm sure that will result in a somewhat improved car. But even still, as it is, this really is the height of quirky Frenchness. The rear windscreen looks absolutely bizarre from outside, but in here actually is pretty good. Visibility is excellent too, thanks to the ridiculous amount of glass in here. Though these wing mirrors do look oddly small, they just look like they weren't meant to be here. They look like they're from an entirely different car. They're probably a bit aerodynamic or something, I don't know. The little spoiler at the back is a two-stage affair, I'm told, although I'm not sure I've actually seen it rise up yet, so I'm not sure exactly how quick you have to go in order to get it to do its thing. 
that sport mode is going off indeed as is the sports mode for the gearbox because it's simply unnecessary a nice big diesel engine like this has plenty of pull from low down so there's no need to let it rev and it's just not helping anything yeah, indeed you put your foot down the car will sort of surge forward a bit and it's so bizarre it's such a weird car it's turning circle like tragic oh there are parking sensors front and rear parking sensors foot flap to the floor what's she got nothing nothing at all For relatively little outlay these days, I suppose if you're looking at another luxury car, you could get an old BMW, and as a performance vehicle, that would be a far superior tool. However, it is also a ubiquitous thing. They are absolutely everywhere. If you want to stand out, this is a much better way of doing it. You could, if you want a bit more plushness in your life, go and buy an old Jag, but they, I suspect, are going to cost quite a bit more to run. This car is actually really quite enjoyable. You adopt a certain pace with it very early on, and that's what in most cars will be about five tenths really and it's very very happy doing that and no more you try and push it and it will just wash a bit wide and just get generally very unhappy with you brakes are absolutely fine the controls are all pretty decent the auto gearbox actually normally in a car of this generation i would hate but it suits the character of this and it's certainly smooth enough i have no real issues with it You've got plenty of space in here, I've got loads of headroom, despite the fact it's not a long wheelbase luxury car, there is loads of legroom in the back and the boot is also pretty generously sized as well, meaning this is an excellent car to take on journeys away, trips to the continent, all that sort of stuff. It doesn't actually shake or rattle that much either, it actually seems pretty well screwed together. It's little things I think that would annoy people, stuff like the indicator stalks here, they're exactly the same on the Citroen C4 that my mother had about 15 years ago. They feel just a little bit cheap and light and, and nasty and, and that's a shame because actually this does seem to be a fairly well engineered car. Infotainment down here is also very much of the period with a million different buttons and none of them particularly logically laid out. But you know what? It's a decent car. It is quirky, it is weird, it is French. It may not be quite as advanced and dramatically different as some of its ancestors, but I would say that if you're the sort of person that's always lusted after a DS or even an SM, but you need something a little bit more modern and daily drivable, I think this really would make you proud because I can certainly feel the lineage in here. Anyway, that's enough from me. I hope you've enjoyed this brief little look at a very unusual Citroen. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.